Okay, good morning everyone. This is Maya Ingram. I'm the manager of the statewide hub program. And with me today is my co-host Lynn Hottie. And we welcome our special guest today, Richard Ehlert, the Director of Complex Construction at Health and Human Services Commission, Sharon Schultz, the Hub Director at Texas Department of Criminal Justice, and Greg Obar, the Senior Director for Strategic Management and Hub Coordinator at the University of Texas System, at the University of North Texas System. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, with that, I welcome Richard Ehlert. Good morning. Um, let's see. Uh, there we go. We're switching that over to my screen. Minimize this. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry. Uh, good morning. My name is Richard Eggert. I am the uh, Procurement Director for Complex Construction at the Health and Human Services. Uh, if some of you are on that might have known me in my former life, I was the Procurement Director for the Texas Facilities Commission in Austin uh, for the past 15 years. And uh, <clears throat> myself and three of my staff that I've had with me for over a decade at TFC all moved over to HHSC to help them with their construction uh, purchases. They were given an unprecedented amount of appropriations this last biennium for deferred maintenance and are expecting uh, even more requests uh, in this next session. Of course, with uh, their state revenues, we'll see how that goes, but uh, there is a lot of work to do at state hospital and state supported living centers. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get right into the presentation. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to go over uh, my staff and the staff of the maintenance and construction uh, program at the uh, HHSC. Uh, and then I'm going to just do a quick overview about doing business with the state of Texas. Um, I'm going to give an overview about statewide procurement, some hub information. You hear the term best value quite a bit in state government. What does that really mean? Cover some open market procurement dollar thresholds and requirements. Then I'm going to review the solicitation methods we will primarily be using uh, during this biennium for HHSC and beyond. And then a quick uh, slide on how to respond to these opportunities. <clears throat> I am the director and there is my email and my uh, phone number. John Goodrich worked with me for 13 years at TFC. He moved over with me. He is my senior purchaser. Tom Spears has been the poor sole loan purchaser dedicated for construction at HHSC. And so he's very familiar with the process and the dilemma we face uh, with the aging facilities. And uh, Tom is a very experienced help to our group. Colin Gresham uh, is uh, another employee I brought over with me from the Texas Facilities Commission. And David Moran is as well, and there's their contact info. The hub program at HHSC consists of these individuals. Laura Cagle Hinojosa is the manager. Uh, Stella Rowland is the senior hub person. Uh, Linda Rogers and Marcus Gomez both help us out with construction. So uh, when you're responding to one of our solicitations, you very well may have to interact or you should interact with these folks. They will assist you and even provide a courtesy review of your hub plan within the solicitation period. The staff of the program that we serve, the maintenance and construction or MNC staff, or Renu Razdan is the director of the maintenance and construction group. We currently have a senior director under her vacant. Tony Hackney is the architect. He is over the project managers uh, at MNC. Steve Beard is in contracting and finance with and helps with scheduling and uh, working out the schedules for contracting and finance issues. And Karen Harmon is their dedicated contract manager who puts the paperwork together uh, for the contract that you will eventually sign if you're selected for a war. 
The health and specialty care system does have a mission statement, and it's providing Texans with high quality and individualized care. And of course, part of that means uh, facilities that they can be comfortable in and uh, <clears throat> excel in when they're in these facilities that are dedicated to people with special needs and or illnesses, uh, mental illness. So that's our mission, and it's it definitely flows down to uh, the procurement group and the way we serve uh, the MNC staff. Uh, <clears throat> you may know this, so we'll just uh, kind of go through these, but you can certainly look back through. Procurement for the state of Texas is overseen by the Comptroller of Public Accounts, and there is a link to their uh, website. Uh, if you're gonna be dealing with state entities, you really need to bookmark this page because it's a resource not only for you on how to do business with the state, but it's where you can find opportunities, where you can register for a vendor and or a hub. And of course, uh, that asterisk down at the bottom, uh, you should probably be using Google Chrome as your web browser when you're going through State of Texas Comptroller uh, applications. As I said, there's a vendor resource guide there, a link, and you can register as a vendor on the CMBL, find opportunities for contracts greater than 25K at that point. What's a hub? Well, it's 51% or more active ownership in a state of Texas for-profit business. And the uh, ownerships of one of the following groups would be African American, Hispanic American, Native American, Asian American, American women, and a service-disabled veteran with 20% or more service-connected disability. So that does not mean you are guaranteed work. What that does is put you in a category that requires state funded entities and universities to reach out to hubs when we have solicitation requirements at certain dollar thresholds. So there is the benefit of registering as a hub. And again, I wanna emphasize 51% or more active ownership. There's a link to pursue hub certification and I'm gonna go over what these uh, requirements are for hub notification uh, as we go through the slides here. So I know you hear a lot about best value when a term gets thrown around a lot, it loses its meaning, but believe it or not, there is an actual law or statute that defines what best value is. And if you'll go to a browser and type in Texas government code, You'll come up with a link for Texas Constitution and Statutes. Click on that, and the Texas statutes are in numerical order. And procurement statute starts with 2155. Chapter is .074, best new standard for purchase of goods and services. And what does that say? Well, first of all, it says that the most important considerations that we have to consider are the price whether it meets the specs. Now that doesn't mean the lowest price in every came, count. Uh, and meeting the specs, of course, are the most important in my opinion. I mean, if it doesn't meet the specs, I don't need, if you pay me to take it, I don't want it. So you must meet the criteria that is stipulated in the solicitation. So again, do you fit the specs? And we'll get to that in a moment about relevance to what you're <clears throat> uh, responding to. Then it goes on to say that you can also consider all of these other things. Installation costs, life cycle, reliability, the delivery terms, indicators of vendor performance. And that can be anything from a vendor performance report entered in the controller's system, which, by the way, state agencies and universities are required to do for purchases 25 grand and over. It could also be uh, documentation within a file at an agency. So vendor performance, cost of any employee training, the effect of purchase on agency productivity. It's kind of a strange one. I've never used it or seen it used, but the vendor's anticipated economic impact to the state or a subdivision of the state, that would mean a county municipality, et cetera, including potential tax revenue and employment, and other factors relevant to determining the best value for the state 
in the context of a particular purchase. Now, other factors can't be some made up system of testing. We are required to test by uh, standards that are set in uh, specifications. So, but they are other factors relevant to the purchase at hand. And that is what best value means for the state. There are three major open market dollar thresholds that you need to know about in public procurement. First one is called a spot purchase and it's a zero to 5K. We do not have to use the CMBL, although it is a resource used often. We must obtain one bid. And of course the agency must determine that it is of best value. That would mean that fees are usual and customary. Uh, they're not outside the realm of what you would normally pay. And of course, we always want hub inclusion as much as we can. Next category is called an informal purchase and it's five grand and a penny up to 25K. We must use the CMBL. Again, if you've registered, paid $70 a year to be on that list and you're registered, we will have to send at least three notices to CMBL vendors in the applicable class and item code. And two of those three must be currently active hubs. Now, I teach the advanced public purchasing class for the state of Texas, I did for many years. And uh, I always taught agencies that, you know, just sending out three in this category is a very small net to cast. So the best practice is, of course, we're gonna send it out to as many as we can in the applicable class and item code uh, in order to garner more competition. Just sending out three is not a very big net. We will always award to the low bidder in this category unless there's some justifiable reason, such as vendor performance, uh, non-conformance to a, a factor of the spec, which means you might be disqualified, etc. The last category is called a formal purchase, and it's 25 grand and a penny on up to whatever. We have to notify all vendors on the CMBL in the applicable class and item code. We have to post on the electronic state business daily the solicitation for anywhere from 14 to 21 days. 14 days means everything was out there from day one. You did not have to issue an addendum answering any questions or clarifications. Pretty rare that that happens. 21 days is the minimum if we have to answer questions or make technical clarifications through an addendum. But typically, complex solicitations are posted for 30 days or more. This is a formal process and there are statutory requirements that apply, such as certain response information that is required or you will be disqualified, et cetera. The next dollar threshold you should probably be aware of is 100 grand. And that means that anything over 100 grand must require a completed HUD subcontracting plan when subcontracting is probable. If you're the prime respondent, you must demonstrate some good faith effort in developing this plan, and you have to provide opportunity to hubs for all of your subcontracting needs. Here are the following GFE or good faith effort methods. If you're gonna be a prime vendor and every subcontractor you use is a hub, that's one you've accomplished. And for every contract solicitation, the agency will stipulate a percentage goal for you using as the prime vendor hubs for your subcontracts. And whatever that goal is, once you meet that goal, if you had 25 subcontracts and through 20 of them, you've met or exceeded the goal, you would not have to perform an additional good faith effort for those extra five. However, it's always advised that you perform this good faith effort to for all of your subcontracts. This GFE uh, requires respondents to notify a minimum of three hubs and at least two minority and women trade organizations or development centers of those subcontracting opportunities. And you have to give those entities and those vendors seven working days to digest it, ask you questions and or respond to your request for a bid for your subcontract. Also, if you choose this method, you will have to provide evidence that you did the required outreach and when they say seven working days folks if you send an email out on day one and you accidentally only gave them five days to respond that email will be they'll see that and you will not pass your hub plan 
So you must be sure you give those entities and those vendors that you outreach to seven working days to respond. There is a mentor protege program at the state. That means a prime vendor could develop a vendor underneath them and they're a hub. And then that means they would almost always use that hub as their protege. And then there's self-performing, which we all know in construction is pretty rare, if ever. So I see very little self-performing HSPs through construction. So those are the good faith efforts and the way that you will accomplish to meet your uh, HSP determination. That thing is a pass-fail basis. Once you submit, you cannot change it. You can certainly clarify if they call you up or email you and ask you, hey, uh, what about, uh, I didn't see this documentation. Yes, you're allowed to say, oh, I have that. You're allowed to send that in. Uh, changes can be made during the execution of the awarded contract. Should your needs change, I know you may have to terminate a vendor or vendors move on, or you may have to get another one. However, those changes must be approved by your agency hub person. Uh, HHS strongly encourages respondents to seek an HSP courtesy review. That means that early in the process, you've already jumped on it and you've done a somewhat good faith effort, Just reach out. You can send your documentation and your preliminary HSP to the hub program and they will look at that and see if you're on the right track. The key is that it has to be done before seven days are due before the proposal or bid is due. Because if there is an error, you may need to correct it through another seven working day to outreach to hub. Uh, let me tell you how what I've seen for some hub failures in this category. One is that the vendor said that they met the goal, or the prime vendor said, I met the goal for the hub subcontractors, 23%. I have 23% hub subcontractors. And then when that comes in, we actually find out that, well, one of these hubs is not an active hub. So now you're not meeting the goal and you're probably disqualified. So I encourage you to do what you can to meet the goal, but you should most always do the traditional good faith effort, which is the seven working day time for them to respond. Sorry. This section right here, seven working day response. So that's your safest bet once it's done correctly. I also want to just say lastly that uh, be sure that when you're going to look for hubs, you don't use your hub list from three months ago. That's where the mistake comes in, where people think they're outreaching to hubs and they're not. You should always go to the CMBL for every solicitation fresh and run a completely fresh list. Now I'm going to go over the uh, major uh, solicitation methods at the state of Texas. Uh, there's an IFB, Invitation for Bid. Uh, that is primarily used for the purchase of goods and services. That's when there's a very clearly defined spec, such as a part number, very little ambiguity. And that means we can boil it down once you meet minimum qualifications to the money. Often we will use an IFB in an emergency and a proprietary purchase. Like I said, awarded the lowest bid amount. You will have to meet some agency stated minimum quals. You will have to demonstrate those in your bid response. Some agencies allow you to clarify that if it's missing, some do not. Be sure you read it, say what it says, and respond. Negotiations really never allowed in a formal IFB situation, although there are two exceptions. If it's an actual declared emergency, and if we only get one response, the state uh, should be allowed to negotiate. At the opening of these, they are open to the public, as all formal openings are. However, at the bid opening, we will read the names and the prices. Next one is an RFP. It's primarily used for the purchase of services. We do quite of these in construction procurement. You're required as a respondent to propose how the goods and services will be delivered. At HHSC, we have 40 points assigned for pricing, 60 for qualifications. Our standard qualifications criteria are these right here. Respondents' ability to provide construction services and propose teams, I'm going to emphasize this word, relevant experience. Respondents' quality and safety program, financial stability and risk, and we're going to ask you to propose some methodology. 
and there are the points allocated for those on the right. This process allows for an interview, also known as an oral presentation, so that we can clarify your response. Uh, they may be with all of them. It may be with just the highest ranked respondents. Uh, after we have the interviews, the tabulation is uh, set up from the point factors, the 60 for Paul, 40 for Price. Award goes to the highest scoring vendor with negotiation and or BAFO uh, done uh, after that. Uh, the RFP opening is open to the public. However, uh, for construction, we do read the names and all the prices. RFQs primarily used for professional services. Uh, as of Texas Government Code 2254, respondents required to demonstrate their qualifications. As a matter of fact, they're not allowed to even ask for money in an RFQ for professional services. You'll see those are the same basic criteria, sans the pricing. Uh, same thing, an oral presentation interview, highest rank respondent. Negotiation obviously is allowed since we don't have any fees from you yet. And at the opening, we obviously can only read the names of the respondents because there's no money involved. Here's a quick slide on the differences between the three solicitation methods. And you can review those as you can, but I kind of already said these on previous slides. Here are the solicitation methods we'll be using during this biennium. Uh, for HHSC, uh, a lot of competitive sale proposal, RFP, it's the same thing. If you hear competitive sale proposal, request for proposal, that's the same thing. Uh, those are used when single solicitations have drawings that are 100% completed. We bundled a lot of projects to uh, make it more attractive for larger vendors. Uh, construction manager at risk method is also facility targeted, and we bundled some projects together. And we may be using some job probably not until fiscal year 21. Uh, we have established a very vendor-friendly culture in my group. We always did uh, vendor-friendly things at TFC, and we have now extended that over to HHSC. And the things I can guarantee to you that my group will do our best to serve you as a respondent is, that first of all, we're going to provide open, honest, and timely communication. That means we're going to be efficient. We're going to be timely and have thorough response to your addendum issues and questions. When you respond to one of our solicitations at HHSC, if you are a respondent, we will send you out a response tabulation. Now, that may not have the pricing on it, but it will show you who responded. Uh, we also communicate throughout the solicitation and award process. We will notify people who have disqualifications immediately. We'll call you and discuss it with you, explain to you uh, why you're being disqualified. Uh, and we conduct mandatory pre-proposal conferences that creates networking opportunities. We always schedule two uh, because they're mandatory. You only have to attend one. And of course, right after we have those two PPCs, we will post the contact information uh, about those PPCs on the ESBD through an agenda so you will know uh, who attended. For CMR solicitations, we will be scheduling a Meet the Prime event to the awarded vendor prior to the guaranteed maximum price bidding exercises. Uh, that is so that they will reach the prime vendor, CMR, will reach out to hubs. They will come for a two or three hour event, find out what the job is like, offer their qualifications, and take part in uh, the bidding exercise. We also offer vendor debriefs for unsuccessful respondents after the award is made. Uh, now, let me explain to you what debriefs are and what they're not. Debriefs are a review with the purchaser about your submittal and our perceived interpretation of weaknesses or areas that you could improve for evaluators to garner your information. Debriefs are never a discussion about anybody else's proposal and how those scores favored that vendor. You can always ask for an open records request for the winning vendor submittal so that you can review and compare how they put that together. We also provide educational outreach. I have a webinar very similar to this one uh, at that link there, but we will also be providing other educational opportunities such as writing winning proposals. It's for vendors about how to put a proposal together and for professional services, writing winning requests for qualifications. Okay, I'm gonna switch over lastly, and these are all in here, so I'm not, I'm just gonna explain what these slides are because I'm already over my time and I know Maya's already throwing darts at my picture on the wall. So let me go ahead and just tell you, this is the state hospital deferred maintenance schedule. We have the title, type, budget, 
comments, what we think we're going to use as a solicitation method, and the facility is down at the bottom of each section. So as you can go through and see the things that we are planning to solicit, both for state hospitals, and this one is for state supported living centers. And lastly, we post at the link on that slide there, we post a weekly forecast of what we have done since we started working over there. We started being able to actually get solicitations out in February. Um, and these are the ones that are posted so far, so they're lost opportunities. However, we are also posting all of the solicitations that are coming up. So anything in red from the previous week is a change. As you can see, this one's full of red because we just added the fiscal year 20 and 21 projects. And down here at the bottom is a legend about what these numbers mean. ABL is Abilene, AUL, Austin State Supported Living Center, et cetera. So that is really, let me switch back to this. I think that is the end of my presentation. And uh, lastly, I just wanna say how you're gonna respond to these opportunities. You should always register on the CMBL. Don't take the 70, uh, the free registration as a hub because statute requires purchasers to send notification to vendors registered on the CMBL. And that's for people who pay their $70 a year. If you register as a hub, I think you can register free, but you will be put on a list. Hubs not on CNEL, and not every agency is required to outreach to those folks, or they don't even have the resources or the time to do it. So be sure you pay your $70 and be on the CNEL. When you get a solicitation, read every requirement specified in the solicitation document. Ask in the specified manner the single POC, which is almost always the purchaser, unless it's for hub, for hub questions, about any questions you may have or clarifications you may need. Always consider your time and effort and resources to determine if the goods or services is something you can provide as specified in the manner and time prescribed. This is the state. You must be competitive. Uh, and then there are two things you need to be responsive and responsible. You need to be both. Responsive means when you turned your submittal in, everything we asked for is there. Now, we can always ask for some minor clarification things, but the solicitation will always stipulate what must be submitted. And if it's not, you can be disqualified. So when you submit everything you need to be evaluated, that's responsive. And responsible means that if we, after we evaluate, we call you up and or email you and approach you for an award, you are ready, willing, and able to accept that award and perform as specified. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Richard. That was some great information. Let's go to the next slide. So with this, we're gonna turn it over to Sharon Schultz at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Maya. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? Uh, I can hear yes, you, sir. Can. Okay, great. Okay, um, my name is Sharon Schultz. Again, I'm the hub director for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And I'm going to talk to you today about doing uh, construction contracts with TDCJ. Can you go to the next slide, please? The Texas Department of Criminal Justice, as most of you know, I'm sure, is the state prison system for the state of Texas. We have over 100 prison units spread out across the state of Texas, every corner, nook, and cranny. Um, and we have employees all over the state of Texas as well. So we're the largest employing state agency. So we procure, buy, and take care of all of our employees on top of our 130,000 inmates that we support. The mission of the HUB program for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is stated, um, that basically it is to promote and increase opportunities with HUB businesses. We do what we can to assist not only those businesses, but the agency staff in order to be successful. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, hey. 
TDCJ does diff business a little bit differently than most of the state agencies when it comes to construction opportunities. We post all of our construction and construction quote type bid opportunities that are in excess of 25000 on the Electronic State Business Daily. I have included the link to um, the ESBD so that vendors can understand and learn where to go and find those opportunities themselves instead of waiting and hoping that maybe they'll be notified because uh, they're signed up on the um, CMBL. If you're not on the CMBL or if you maybe don't have the class and item codes that the bids may post at when they post on the CMBL, then all bidders or anyone who's interested in bidding any state contract can always go to the ESBD and see what's out for bid at that time. Again, bids that are in excess of $25,000 are posted on the ESBD for all state agencies. All of our construction projects, as I said, are there because they are going to be at least $25,000, and most of them are a lot more than $25,000. Uh, any vendor can bid on TDCJ or state contracts that are posted on the ESBD as long as they meet the requirements. Um, hubs, non-hubs, uh, anything, anything on there. So please. A lot of times I'll have hubs say, well, I'm not, or non-hubs say I'm not certified yet. I'm going to go through the process, but I'm not certified. So they won't even go out there and think they don't qualify to bid on contracts. That's not true. Anyone can, and I'll say, it's great if you're getting certified. We certainly want that. But if you're not, please don't wait. Please go ahead and go out and look and see what you can do with the state and with all the agencies. Can you go to the next slide, please? Once you go into the link for the Electronic State Business Daily, it'll bring up a screen like this. If you are searching for TDCJ, Construction Opportunities, then what I would suggest is to go into the agency slash Texas Smart Buy member number box and enter 696, which is TDCJ's agency number. Make sure under the status box on the left-hand side, that it is the posted, selected, and then hit your search button. Next slide, please. Once you hit the search button, you'll see opportunities that will come up that uh, meet the, re the criteria that you have selected, which means everything that TDCJ has posted uh, at that current time, unless it is a commodity or something else that may be bid out by the comptroller's office in which it would fall under their number. But when we're looking at construction contracts for TDCJ, they will all fall under our agency number, which again is 696. So once you pull it up, this is what I did the other day when I was putting together the uh, PowerPoint. So we have quite a few more. Keep in mind that these things change daily. So they fall off, new ones come on. Uh, we had, as you'll see, the first one is generators. The huge unit, um, 21 ton uh, air handling unit, is a resolicitation that's up there. And that is a construction type contract. So if you were to click on that, which I didn't put the next slide in, I probably should have. Uh, if you were to click on that, then what would come up would be information about that particular bid. Okay, so on that bid, um, a short uh, description of it that would come up on the on the page once you clicked on it would be that that we are looking for a purchase order for the procurement of a 21 ton multi zone air handler to include delivery, startup, and training. And then you'll see packages listed under that or attachments listed under that. And if you click on each of the attachments, it gives you more information that you need for the bid process. Most of our construction type projects are not done on purchase orders. However, we have quite a few HVAC uh, contracts or HVAC projects that are out at this time and they are being put on purchase orders. 
so that is why this one in particular is. We currently do a whole lot of uh, construction opportunities that include HVAC. Um, it's pretty hot and heavy for TDCJ these days. So some of our top construction contracts include HVAC, boilers, chillers, roofs. Um, those, are, those are the ones that we have the majority of pretty much almost all the time. And so when I go further on this list, because it only listed a few of them, as you can see, we had another air-cooled chiller package. We have uh, elevator solicitations. So on the elevators, they're for things like um, sealed bids, and they're doing sealed bids on these. So they were for labor material parts and supplies for preventative and routine maintenance for elevators in different regions um, of the state. Uh, replacing boilers and storage tanks, 30, 40 ton HVACs. Um, some of these are resolicitations. We seem to have a lot of that these days. We have one out there for four HVAC units at one of our units. Um, construction of elevated storage tanks. Replace uh, booster stations and ground storage tanks more um, HVAC units. So one thing you might do, say you're going in and you're looking to see what opportunities TDCJ has that you might could bid on. When you look at these, and for instance, say you're looking at uh, the 21 ton unit, go into the packages and look and see what all that entails. Because a lot of times on things like these, you may not think about what the subcontracting opportunities may be. So as I said, TDCJ does our construction a little bit different. So we're going to post them all on the ESBD for everyone to be able to bid on. Okay, so uh, our vendors are going to have to, in most cases, these contracts are going to be over $100,000. So as Richard talked about the hub subcontracting plan, we require a hub plan on almost all of our construction because they are going to be over $100,000. So our prime bidders are going to be looking for subcontractors to do, to do their bid process. So when you go and you click on these bid packages, so if you were to click on the huge the TDCJ huge unit, 21 ton, then you would find that there would be a pre-proposal, pre-bid, site visit. We call it different things depending on pretty much who's bidding it out. Uh, but there would be one identified in there, a date and time and location. Make sure that you go to that location because if you've gone into that solicitation package, you might find that they're going to need to rent cranes or porta potties or um, transportation of materials and supplies into that unit. They may be uh, looking for someone to purchase the unit from. There's uh, a lot of opportunities that while you may not be able to bid a 21 ton unit, you may be able to bid some of the subcontracting opportunities that are involved with it. If you go to the site visit, then you will be able to meet the, sub, the prime bidders that will most likely be bidding the bid. Some of our pre-bid site visits are mandatory. Most of them are not, but some of them are mandatory. So if it's mandatory, it will state that it is. And that means if you're not there at the site visit, you will not be able to bid. Okay, so it, only if it's a mandatory. Uh, you do not have to be there if you're going to bid as a sub. But again, if you're interested in subcontracting on any of our contracts, try to be there at those site visits or pre-bids. That's where you get front row seat to all the primes that will be there for not only the current contract that you're looking at, but for any future ones. So I highly encourage that. I know every state agency does. We beg and we plead vendors to come, especially hub certified vendors, because it helps. Since Richard went through the HSP process, it kind of helps explain what benefit there is to a prime bidder to be able to utilize hubs 
to meet the goals on their subcontracting plan or uh, to meet the to meet all the subcontracting opportunities if that's possible. So keep in mind that uh, the best way for you to get in front of vendors if you're interested in bidding as a subcontractor. And also keep in mind that, again, while you may not be able to bid the specific unit itself, you may be able to bid a subcontracting opportunity for them. Okay? TDCJ, when we, when we have the site visits or we have the pre-bids and the contract is expected to be over 100000 there will always be a hub program representative there. And we will go through the hub subcontracting plan in pretty detail, pretty much as detailed as we can, to make sure that our vendors understand they have to complete a hub plan and that it has to be done correctly in order for their bid to be acceptable or be, to be even to be considered. So once uh, we open a bid that required a hub subcontracting plan, that is our first evaluation criteria is the HSP. So it comes straight to the hub program, we do a review of it, and then we prepare an ISD to the purchaser or the contract specialist and let them know that either they are acceptable or not. If they are not acceptable, the bid is not considered. So it's very important that those HSPs are done correctly. Um, can you go to the next slide? Okay, and so this kind of talks about just about what I talked about. Um, we, we will be there, we'll talk about the HSP. Now, we do everything we can uh, through the process, the bid process. So prior to once a bid has posted out on the ESBD for bid, um, the TDCJ hub team is, is very user friendly. We are there to do anything we can to help a vendor be successful in the bidding process. So the TDCJ hub team in particular is there to assist vendors through the entire process, whether it's before, during, or after uh, the bid process. So we too will evaluate H HSPs prior to bid openings. Um, in our case, I'm going to say the vast majority of the time, our bids are awarded uh, based on low bid, as long as they have met the specs required for the bid. Um, we do attach to all of our HSPs and our bid packets a list of possible hub subcontractors that can meet the requirements for subcontracting on the bid. But of course, as we explain in pre-bid conferences, we may not hit all of those. Uh, we try, but we don't know who will be bidding and what their capabilities may be. So um, we make sure that uh, we let our bidders know that if they require more assistance in identifying hubs in different areas, then they can certainly get in touch with us and we'll assist them through that. Again, we will review the HSPs prior to bid opening and we will help them through and during the bid process. Uh, we also work with our vendors after award to make sure that they maintain um, current HSPs, that amendments are done if they need to be done, when they are supposed to be done, and just make sure we're available for all of those processes. Um, the TDCJ is uh, uh, very user-friendly when it comes to our construction projects. So I highly encourage anyone who's interested in doing business with our agency to uh, please take advantage of the resources we offer, especially the TDCJ Hub Team. Uh, if you, and most do, if you're a little reluctant about going out to a prison unit uh, to do a, a pre-bid or a site visit, uh, I'll just say it's not as scary as it sounds. So we highly encourage our hubs. We um, encourage even our non-hubs. We work quite heavily with some of our non-hubs who bid a lot of our contracts uh, because a lot of times they are the ones who are utilizing our hubs and, and helping them get in the door. So next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, thank you. 
So here are the contact information for all the hub team at TDCJ or small staff that we, we do the best we can to assist all of our vendors. So feel free to reach out with us for any questions or concerns or um, assistance you may need. And thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, Sharon. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to introduce Greg Obar from the UNT system. So hello, so um, I will keep it brief. The good news is, is that half of my slides have already been, uh, have already been gone over today. So I can hit the, uh, hit the hi highlights for us. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So here's some information about us. I won't go through the whole thing, um, but you have the slide and you can uh, look and sort of see about who, who we are. We're the uh, large university system up in the north part of the state. So next slide, please. So I won't go through these, but these are the type because um, the mister at the very beginning did 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 that for us. Um, but these are the ones that we usually use for construction related for construction related I items. Um, next, please. So this varies slightly from the best val best value that you saw at the beginning. Um, uh, this is a different statute. I put it in there because it um, talks about uh, Part B six there talks about the fact that we are allowed to consider um, hub status with determining uh, best, val best value. Next slide, please. So for construction related stuff, the typical selection commi committee includes these, these folks. So there's some, somebody from UNT system facilities, there's the campus stakeholders there, for example, if we're building a residence hall, then the v v VP of that sort of thing will sit on the team um, uh, and a person from UNT or the campus facilities will, will be there because as you saw in the pre previous slide, we have a campus in Denton, we have UNT Dallas, which is located in Dallas, we have UNT Health Science Center located in Fort Worth, and then the System Administration Building is in, is in downtown Dallas, next door to our um, law our law school, which is the only public law school in Dallas. Um, somebody from the purchasing de department, like a buyer, they'll be the hub coordinate hub coordinator, which is me. They'll be the construction solicitation co coordinator and other relevant representatives. Um, the takeaway from this slide is if you need to ask somebody questions, if it's hub related, ask the hub co coordinator. If it's not hub, hub related, ask only the UNT system construction solicitation coordinator because you could be disqualified if you contact somebody else. Next slide, please. So here's the things that we typically evaluate for construction. Um, they talk about this a little, little bit already, so I won't go too uh, deep in the weeds about it, but you'll have a cop copy of the slide that you can look at. And if you have any questions, um, reach out to me. I will hi highlight uh, certain things. Um, relevant experience is, is, is huge, and it's the relevant experience of the team you're proposing, not just your firm. So um, because you know, the brain doesn't exist to the firm. The brain and experience um, belongs to the, the team that you're proposing. And um, next slide, please. All right, so here's some tips, right? Okay, play close attention to the criteria. Don't, uh, don't make it up. Make sure responses are detailed, concise, and e e easy to read. And there is a page of uh, limit for some of these. Um, grammar and spelling are important. I know it doesn't directly re relate to your ability to lay concrete or drive a nail, but the theory is that if you don't have the attention to detail to um, correct your spelling, then you won't lay concrete right. All right, so um, please just make sure it's professionally put um, together. The team that you propose to do this job needs to be the right team, okay? And we can talk about that offline, what that means. 
um, it needs to be folks who have experience in the in the type of job that you're um, respond, responding to and avoid canned responses. Um, uh, we are UNT, there's an N between the U and the T and you would be shocked at the amount of folks who say, we would love to work for UT and we're like, well, great, I can put you in touch with them, but that isn't us. So please make sure you um, pay attention to that stuff and don't recycle your responses too, too much. If you make it to the next stage and you're selected to come in to talk to us, make sure your key team members are present. Okay, if you're if the project executive or the superintendent is too busy to come to interview us, there could be a pre presumption that they're too busy to uh, be present when it's time to do other work. So please make sure the folks are there. Um, and you are I. Most of our pre pre bids, I can't recall one that we did that was man mandatory. But regardless of your hub status, regardless of your size, regardless of your interest level in the process, you're at a minimum your business de de development or your estimator team needs to be at the pre bid or pre solicitation meeting. There is so much good networking to to be done there. Next slide, please. So here's some of the things we've got. Um, so you may or may not be aware we're building a $110 million uh, project in Frisco. We've already selected the G GC, it's Vaughn. Bid packages are out on the street right, right, right now. The point of contact at Vaughn Construction is listed there. Um, lucky him, I did not ask him if I could put him on the slide, but I did, so you can reach out to him di directly. They have committed to a full third or third 30% hub utilization, so let's help them get to that goal. And that is a CM at risk. Um, so they're, they're still working on the GMP. Um, UNT Discovery Park. Okay, so the UNT Frisco job, of course, is located in Frisco. Um, the UNT Discovery Park MEP upgrades, that's in our, that's the north side of Denton. The G GC is small glass. Bid packages are, um, are uh, on the street soon. We have a pre pre bid June 16th and June the 23rd. Please reach out to me if you're interested. My contact uh, data is at the last slide, and I will send you the slides of that. And you can also I encourage you to reach out directly to Mitch, who is their point of contact at Spall Spall Glass. They have committed to meeting the state goal, which is 21.1 percent. Next slide, please. Um, upcoming projects part two. So UNT Health Science Center, like I said, is in Fort Worth. The G GC for that is Structure Tone Southwest. The GMP is in, but they're still looking for uh, trades. I believe the first package or two um, are done, but they're still looking for trades. Please reach out to the gentleman on bullet three. They are committed to meeting the state goal of 21.1%. Um, and stay tuned for more. We have a whole bunch of small, small stuff going on, but uh, we're still an analyzing what will be put on hold due to the budget um, things occurring due to the current pandemic. Next slide, please. So we won't go through all of this because you heard it from the experts at the very, at the very beginning. But I will tell tell you we um, list all of our form for formal bids at that website there, untsystem.edu backslash bids. We also put them on the ESPD. And um, my my team and I, we send them out to folks that we know on our networker and via the C CMBL as well. Next slide. Okay, so what's coming to Frisco? A little more about what we talked about at UNT Frisco. So as you know, there's a part partnership between the city of Frisco, um, Frisco, Economic and Community Development Corporation and UNT, which is our flagship in Denton. So um, there's two parts, right? So we purchased a 50,000 square foot building in Frisco, and we've had classes there for months already. Um, uh, and we're building the new Frisco. We've got $110 million um, ear, earmarked for that. That's construction, that's FF&E. Um, that's a whole bunch of stuff. So it's not just the the construction. That's the total budget of the project. So all the science equipment they're going to need, and all the um, 
uh, you know, lab support and all the classroom support, like a like low old, low voltage AV, et cetera. All right, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, part two. So now that's the branch campus we were ta talking about. Um, it's it's aiming at five thousand students. And um, it's not your traditional school. It's going to be business related. I think if you think of UNT and Denton, you think about our jazz pro program. You think about some of the fine fine arts we have out there. All the, all although we have one of the best business schools in the state as well. But when people think about Denton, they think about our music, and they should. Um, we're the best in the world at that. But in Frisco, it's going to be focused, I, I believe, a bit more on business and technology. So you can see the de, 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 the design firm there. It's Air St. Gross. The CCM risk is Vaughn. We uh, mentioned that that already. Bid packages. Some are out on the street already. Some are still to be released. Please reach out to Brad for more info on bid packages. Construction expected to begin in 2021, and it'll be com uh, complete in 2023. And we're expecting students in seats in 2023. Um, and then you see the money there. So it's big money to that area. And I want to see that money spent all over Dallas and that area, not just in Frisco. Uh, next slide, please. So people have asked, well, what does it look like for us? So um, our enrollment is back on track and is on track to meet or exceed last year. Some expenditures are going to have to be cur curtailed because we, uh, we lost re 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 revenue in uh, the spring. Um, so when you're responding to our bids, pricing will be important, okay? So, um, and then uh, uh, if you happen to be a PPE guy, please contact John at that e email address there and let, let him know. And uh, my outlook is, is we're going to, or our collective outlook is we're going to emerge from this stronger and better and leaner and meaner, et cetera etc okay next slide please okay so here's the staff so that's me and i have a specialist and we cover four four schools or three schools and a system system head headquarters so as you can imagine we're we're hopping there's usually one per school but there's we have one per system um so that's us uh you're free to reach out to me that's my desk phone um, and but the best way to get a hold a hold of me is my e email address there. Um, next slide, please. I think that might be our last one. Booyah! All right, thank you. Wow, that's some great information. Thank you to all of our speakers. If you have any questions, you will see their contact information again at the end. Please reach out to them. There's lots of work, lots of construction related information so thank you to our speakers again and uh lynn i'm going to turn it over to you we'll start with questions um and discussion and we'll have uh, mr tom hay from our office read out the questions and we'll provide y'all some answers and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can if we don't get them all answered today we will get the answers and post them with the presentation to our website. So we will get your questions answered. So Tom, if you wanna go ahead and read some of the questions. Sure, Lynn, thank you. We do have a few questions that have been posed. Um, first question, and I believe this was during Richard's presentation. Uh, do you have a CIP or a capital improvement plan? So Richard had to leave on an emergency. So he said he would come back uh, get back to us and answer the questions so we can have them posted. But he apologizes he had an emergency. Okay, okay, because the, the second question I think was also directed to Richard as well. Um, and I'll just read the question, we'll wait for an answer, but if, if you have met the GFP goal by subcontracting to a hub for the required percent, do you still have to contact two other hubs? So we will. Well, and I think we can go ahead and answer that one for them. Um, if you're completing your hub subcontracting plan and there has been an identified hub goal and you intend to fulfill that project um, utilizing hub subcontractors that meet or exceed that percentage, that goal, 
uh, then you'll complete method A of the HUB subcontracting plan. And on method A, you're not required to contact um, three or more HUB vendors or two or more minority trade organizations. Um, but if you fall under that HUB goal that's identified for that project, you will need to do the good faith effort in reaching out to the HUB firms and the minority trade organizations. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Uh, next question. When will Hub Talk have a session on Mentor Protege program? So we don't have one scheduled at this time. Um, if for anyone that needs specific information, please call me, Maya Ingram, or call the 800 number for the Hub program, and we'll go over it. Um, we will schedule one, but it is not going to be till probably the fall. Okay, hey, thank you, Maya. Next question, how do we find out what projects will be coming in North Texas? I guess that question is aimed at me. Uh, so reach out to me and let's talk about it based on what your, I mean, what, what, what you do. If you're construction, which would make sense because it's just a construction chat, then let's um, talk about it. Um, uh, if you're just construction support, like if you do, you know, FF and E or some something, there's there's more out there. So let's um, you have my e email address. Let's uh, let's chat. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, let's see. Next question, and again, I believe this was during uh, Richard's presentation, but the question is, will there be any opportunities for materials testing or geotechnical opportunities? Uh, and if we need to wait on an answer for that one, we can. Well, I think that's for him, but for UNT, so we have an I IDIQ for that, and we just released it and just awarded it. So it'll be another three or four years before we go out to I IDIQ on that. Right. So, so I think that's. Go ahead. go ahead, Greg. No, I'm done. Thanks. Uh, mo most, for the audience, most universities. Um, like Greg said, we'll have some sort of contracting for that, and it usually is in place for about four years. So contact those university co hub coordinators or agency hub coordinators and inquire about that specific opportunity. They should be able to tell you what type of contract they have in place, how they let that out, and when it's up for rebid. Land, this is Sharon. Can I enter something in there? Sure. Um, we we do have a contract in place as well for our testing requirements. However, on some of our construction contracts, it requires that the vendor do testing as a part of the contract, uh, and we require that they not use the uh, vendor we have on contract. So that's another one of those options where you might look at what's posted out there for bid on those construction contracts and see if that is a subcontracting opportunity within that bid. Okay. okay, thank you both very much. Uh, next question, a two-part question. Uh, part one, can we contact Sharon? Part two, I have tried to reach the general contractor who solicited me for a proposal and said to call if there were questions. I have tried and tried and even had a man try, and I can't reach that person. What should I do? Okay, was that one that was that one for me? Uh, I believe so. If the first part was was can we contact Sharon? You can always contact Sharon. Okay. Okay. And then they were trying to reach a general contractor and are not getting any responses after they were contacted. And what what to do about that? They need to contact their hub director and let them know they're having problems. We don't so. What I'm guessing is that they um, solicited to them and, and now they're non-responsive to their response back. Um, so if, you know, a, a lot of vendors in the past, you know, way back when the HSPs were a little bit different, um, that was one of the problems is vendors would say they contacted hubs and when they really didn't. And so that was a problem with a lot of the hubs were saying they're not really contacting us. Uh, on the HSPs, for those of you who don't know, that when the prime bidders 
uh, do solicitations and they have to identify who they solicited to as far as the hubs are and whether or not they received a response from them. So if you did respond to uh, say a prime and that's what the question is about and they haven't gotten back with you, then yeah, I would call the, the hub director about the specific project and see maybe if it's been awarded and, and what happened with it if you can't reach the prime. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, next question, uh, just to read it, we do have an answer already. What is PPE? Uh, PPE stands for Personal Protective Equipment, and that include mask, includes masks, face coverings, hand sanitizers, etc. cetera. Uh, next question, does UNT system use third-party project management vendors, or is that handled in-house? Uh, we do that in in-house. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, next question. If a certified hub contractor bids as a prime, can the hub goal be met by the prime's involvement since they are a certified hub? If you ask 100 different hub, coordinator, hub coordinators, you're gonna get 100 variations on that um, response. So I'll let you know what we do here. So the statute allows us, it's, this is not something that can be inter interpreted or misconstrued, shouldn't be. The statute allows us that if the prime is a hub and they are self-performing 25% or more, we get 100% hub credit for that particular job. That said, if it's a construction job and they're doing 24%, we would not get 100% hub credit, but we would be meeting the state of Texas hub goal because the state of Texas hub goal for construction is 21.1%. I have heard that some of my peers interpret it and say, no, no, you're not reaching your hub goal unless it's hub sub subcontracting. Um, I disagree with that because hub spend is hub spend, but um, I'm relatively new to this. I've only been doing it for five, five years. So um, that's open for debate, but we do allow people to count their own participation if they're a hub prime. Right, and, and for purposes of responding to a bid, I need you to think about this, um, and this is what we advise our vendors on. If you are a company and you're responding to a bid opportunity um, at any agency or university, when we talk about a hub goal and we include a hub subcontracting plan, at that phase, it's pertinent to subcontracting. So you can't count yourself in towards that hub goal when you're proposing and um, responding to subcontracting and how you're going to subcontract out. That really is at that phase relative to your response and your subcontracting percentages. Now, ultimately, you as the prime respondent get to determine how you can best fulfill that contract. So. Uh, if you want to self-perform, you can. If you want to sub out to other hubs or non-hubs, you certainly can do that. You will be required to complete the corresponding method. Um, and again, you wouldn't include your company as a subcontractor on that form when responding to that bid. Okay, thank you, Lynn and Greg. Uh, next question, are there any quality assurance opportunities available? Hey, before before we answer this um, next one, I want to dot, 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 and the uh, last one. I would say when in doubt and you're doing a response, your hub coordinator at the institution to whom you're responding is available to answer your questions questions don't wing it and don't guess right so don't 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 go to UT Dallas or don't go to the DIR and say Greg said I could do this and then you end up getting get, get disqualified because of something that you know you may have misinterpreted or I misinterpreted or whatever if you're if you're a hub supplier and you have questions or if you're not a hub supplier and you have questions about the hub program before responding and hoping for uh, the best reach out to your hub coordinator of the institution to which you're responding. I mean, we're, we are here to serve. 
Yeah, Sorry and that's that. correct. No, no, Greg's correct in that. If you have a bid and it's from DPS or Tech Stock or UT Dallas or uh, Texas A&M system, contact that hub coordinator specific to that procurement. They're going to be the ones reviewing those plans and they're going to be the ones giving you their guidelines. Okay. Thank you for that follow up. Uh, the, the repeat, the question was, is are there any quality assurance opportunities available? Can they be more uh, specific? QA sure. On what? sure. If you can, if you can uh, further qualify your question, uh, please enter it in the box. Uh, question, what is the length that the questions and answers will be on when posted? Some of these questions are good. So what we will do um, at DIR is we're going to take and um, make the vi this recording accessible and we are going to attach the handouts, the recording and the questions and answers. You will be able to find those links on the dir.texas.gov hub program page. Um, so we will post that. I know um, we share that with CPA. We'll also share that with our presenters today with Greg, Richard, and Sharon so that they can um, share, share that with any of the vendors should y'all contact them and have questions. But it can be located on dir.texas.gov. And if you search in our search bar hub program and scroll down to about the middle towards the end of the page, you will see the previous recordings posted with questions and answers, and you will find this presentation as well. Okay, that looks like the uh, end of the questions list. Unless anybody has any more, feel free to enter those questions into the, into the question box, and we can work to get you an answer. But as of now, those are the questions that have been posed. Okay, awesome. Um, Tracy, if you'll take us to the next slide. So we have two additional um, hub talk series. Um, our, our next construction talk will be on June 24th at 10 a.m. We've included the registration link there. Something that we're doing as well is we're going to have a session next Wednesday on June 17th, and we're gonna discuss mastering the centralized master bidders list. So we will have the program staff from the CMBL that's housed within the comptroller's office presenting on the CMBL, how to create your profile, um, what information you need to include, because you heard Richard, you heard Sharon, you heard Greg all um, refer to the CMBL, refer to that's the location where we're required to look for hub certified vendors. So I, I highly encourage you to participate in this class. Um, so, you know, find the unique differences, find what works for you and your company so you can make your profile unique, your profile descriptive. Um, you don't want to tell us that you're selling everything in the kitchen sink. Um, you want it to be reflective of the services and products that you provide. So I highly encourage you um, participating in that event as well. And then when you register for these upcoming courses, if you will make sure to enter in your email address before you hit the submit button, that's how we communicate with you. So that's how we're sending out presentations. That's how we're sending out the links for you to click on when it's time to attend the event. Um, make sure you include all your registration information in there when you're registering for these two upcoming events. Next slide. And again, it was asked, um, we have posted our previous talk series recordings. Uh, you can see there the topics, you can see the date that we held those um, on, and you can find them at that link below. Um, again, it's on dir.texas.gov. Um, so you can find the recordings, you can find the questions and answers, you can find the presentations. And then again, if you have any other questions, um, you're certainly welcome to contact the DIR Hub office. You're welcome to contact any of the uh, presenters that participated in the past series as well. 
So please visit that page if you haven't had an opportunity to hear the previous um, presentations. Next slide. So again, we're gonna give you our contact information. You heard from Maya Ingram. She is with the Comptroller's Office, the Statewide Hub Program Office. She's the manager for the program. Um, and then myself, Lynn Hotty, I'm the director of the Hub Program Outreach and Training. And then you have Richard Ellert with Human and, uh, Health and Human Services Commission, Sharon Schultz with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, and Greg Obar with the University of North Texas System. Um, all of these individuals are wonderful resources. They're wonderful contacts. If you're in construction, you need to know these individuals and they need to know you. So again, like Greg said, reach out and contact them. Um, we, we are a resource for you. It's our job. Um, so we are here to help you. We're here to uh, help you understand how our specific entities procure and buy the products or services uh, that are unique to our agency or university, so use those resources. Um, I think that's it, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up for today. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to direct those to DIR, to the Comptroller's Office, HHSC, TDCJ, or UNT System. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.